started. Um, yeah, so a new topic, resource analysis. So um, the plan for today is um, to talk about the motivation and then talk about cost semantics. So, yeah, what is resource analysis? So, um, yeah, let's um, say I ask um, two of you to implement a program, a mathematical function, and um, how do we decide uh, who of you did a better job? So, um, there are two implementations of the same function. Input and output, yeah, but let's say it's the same mathematical function already. Oh, so it would be benchmarks. benchmarks, yeah, right, efficiency, right? So that's, I think, the main thing we do as computer scientists, not only in North America, as uh, <laughs> Bob um, traumatized a bit, also in Europe, where, where I am from. Efficiency, right? And um, Um, and um, so what does that mean? So um, what do we mean by efficiency? Lots of different things. For instance? How fast it runs. Yeah, time, right, time efficiency. What else? Amount of resources. Yeah, amount of resources, such as memory, right? What else? Yeah. Power yeah, power. Yeah, it could be also something very specific, like um, you know, use of the network or things like that. And then when we talk about um, or when we analyze the efficiency of a program, there are also multiple things we can think about. So we can either think about the worst case. Yeah, so that's a. Another thing, and we can think about the average case. Yeah, we can also think about the best case, but this is usually not something we, we care about. And most often we um, um, care about the worst case because it provides guarantees for um, every input. Uh, so this is the, the thing we, we do. Um, and yeah, no, also like we are um, um, pessimists, so we always assume the, the worst, right? So, and when you, yeah, when you um, see these kind of like worst case and average case of time complexity terms like that, so what you think of is of course analysis of algorithms, which you all learned about. Um, So, um, yeah, when we, um, or when you have your analysis of algorithms course, so um, how does that usually work? So um, you define the algorithm in pseudocode, right? So, um, So that's the first thing um, we do, and um, yeah, what are some problems that that you can think about? I specified in pseudocode, code, yeah. There are some assumptions about how fast you can carry operations on data structures that are too vague. So if you have a set, you're not describing the implementation of the set. You don't actually think about. <coughs> yes, exactly. So the the whole well. There are two things you said, basically. The, the first thing is the implementation 
of the data structures is often like underspecified. You just say you have a set, and then the cost model is also kind of like underspecified, which is related. So it's not really clear what you're really analyzing. So yeah, there's no kind of like semantics for the pseudocode. So um, yeah, let's just say maybe um, relation to the code that runs at the end of the day is unclear. And um, yeah, the cost model it's often not really specified. You know, at least under specified. So the second thing we do is we analyze the complexity, usually time complexity, worst case time complexity, um, using a big O. So Yeah, so and what's the um, definition of that again? Maybe let's write it here um, so that we remember. So f is an O of g, and these are you know, functions, let's say, from the naturals to the naturals, yeah, g2, if um, they exist in n0 and c, so that for all n greater or equal to n0, f of n small o equal to c times g of n. So I think that's the usual definition of big O. And so what um, are the problems with that? Yeah? You can have very fast algorithms in terms of big O that are tremendously slow in practice in terms of high cost in practice. Exactly. So, um, yeah. So, um, might have, um, just say, large constants. So algorithm is slow in practice. Yeah, what else? So when you just you know, have two, let's say, you know, um, algorithms that are um, O of n squared, you know, which one is better? Well, we, don't, we can't tell from that, right? So, um, can't compare two algorithms in, that have the same asymptotics. Asymptotic um, behavior. So, yeah, what else? So, there, there's more, right? I mean, so what bothers me always is this N0 here, right? So, which, so you, you don't really learn anything about small inputs, where by small, I mean something like, you know, number of atoms in the universe. So all inputs, you know, that you will actually think about. So, yeah. But where small actually means large. So um, also something that's interesting um, uh, about Big O is that it's very difficult to probably generalize it to multiple um, input sizes. So if you look at your algorithms book, um, I'm pretty sure the definition you see um, is something like this. 
And then, you know, later come things like graph algorithms where you have, you know, the vertices and the edges, and then they write something, oh, the complexity is of m times n, and it's completely undefined what that even means. And um, you might think like, oh, yeah, well, you know, the um, is a natural way to generalize that, so you just have n and m here, um, and um, then you're done. But um, that's actually not a good definition, so you have weird effects there. Um, then, um, um, for instance, n uh, times m plus 1 is not an O of n times m, and things like that. So you have to do a bit more work, so yeah, it's hard to, to generalize, so that's another um, um, problem with it. So, um, yeah, that's um, big O. Oh yeah, one more thing um, I wanted to say about it um, that I forgot that falls into this um, um, pseudocode um, column is that yeah, something they, they also like to do is they don't specify what the representation of the input is actually. So and that can make a big difference. So for instance, let's say like, oh yeah, given a graph, but you know, how, what is the specification? And in some papers even, um, I feel like they um, choose a particularly unnatural specification where kind of like, you know, if, if it's, every problem is NP hard, if um, it is very difficult to decode the input, right? So, um, so that, that of course is, is also something that's sometimes hidden in the pseudocode notion that is very important. Um, so when I um, say resource analysis, um, so let's say it again here. So um, what I mean by that is that we want to analyze programs. Yeah, instead of algorithms and programs are mathematical objects. So in some sense, um, you know, our job gets a little bit harder because uh, these shortcuts anymore. Um, so we have, you know, uh, of course, a syntax that we have to use and static semantics and most of all, and that's what we're going to talk about today, um, we have a, a cost model. Uh, which we call cost semantics, which is also like defined. So the complexity of um, the program is, is yeah, um, very precisely defined by that. Um, so the second thing that's different is um, so we um, are not to, we're going to do the analysis asymptotically, but um, we take into account the concrete constant factors. So, So yeah, why? Because um, there's no other possibility, basically. So I mean, even if you wanted to say like, okay, we, we only care about the asymptotics, then you still have to find um, the C and the N0 here. So basically you have to figure out what the constant factors are anyway um, to be able to abstract it away. So in some sense, there's no other way. Um, Yeah, if you really want to um, um, be yeah, uh, very precise with the uh, uh, kind of like proof that you do uh, in the end. And um, so, um, yeah, what this implies is um, we want to have some help in uh, doing that. So. Yeah, so in form of some uh, proof rules. Or a type system, that's what. 
we're going to do and so forth that help us to figure out uh, what these constant factors are. Maybe, and that's also something we're going to talk about, even automation, right? You could think of a scenario where you say, like, okay, I have quicksort, so I know, you know, the worst case is some, you know, quadratic um, um, expression in the input size, and, you know, I want my you know, automatic resource analysis to fill in the constant factors automatically, um, which is possible. And here we're going to even talk about um, yeah, techniques that um, you can completely automate, so where you just write the code. Of course, it's an undecidable problem, um, but yeah, um, for some programs, it's it's going to work where you just write you know the program, press a button, and it will give you a complexity bound automatically. So yeah, what we also want. So and that's a Third point I have here. Um, we um, want certificates for the bounds. So, um, yeah, um, let's say bounds come with um, certificates. Yeah, which in our case will be a type derivation, which is a proof for the bound. So in general, by certificate, I mean some kind of like, you know, system of rules where you can get like, you know, a derivation that is then the, the proof of uh, the, the bound. So that's also something um, we want. Okay, so in, in this um, mini course, um, for lecture, so we um, going to focus on a functional programming language. Um, so maybe I'll write that down. So and um, we going to focus on worst case bounds. And um, we also focus a bit, at least, on um, automatic bound inference, which, in our case, um, reduces really to a type inference. So because we're going to have a type system, and then we're also going to talk about yeah, how we can do type inference, which then means uh, uh, bound inference. Um, Okay, yeah, and I said already today we're going to talk about the cost semantics, and um, next time um, we talk about the type system that we use to do the complexity analysis, and we do that for a very simple language. And then um, third lecture we talk about soundness and um, add a bit more stuff to the language, and because of types specifically that Bob will have introduced then already, and. Um, yeah, then in the last lecture, we talk about type inference and um, um, talk also about yeah, how we can make the type system a bit stronger. As I said, it's an undecidable problem. Since we focus on automation, we will have some restrictions on the yeah, type of kind of programs you can analyze and the kind of bounds you, you can get to uh, make this problem tractable. Okay, good questions, concerns, hopes. Good. Um, so let's start. Um, yeah, topic is now cost semantics, and we start yeah with a, a simple functional language. Um, so. Types tau we have in, in this language are just function types, and I always, um, following um, Bob's lectures, have like an abstract and a concrete syntax. So what we have is uh, the arrow for function types, and so we just want one uh, concrete type. So we want to keep it very simple uh, for today, and we just have a unit so that we can, you know, um, actually 
uh, write a function and um, the expressions now also very simple um, hopefully I can squeeze it in here um, so we have variables we have function application and um, we have abstraction yeah, to call it lambda where we always um, give it the type tau so what always counts is the um, abstract syntax and so um, this type tau is the type of the argument and um, yeah, we just added there so that types are unique um, so otherwise if you have the identity function right so then um, um, you would have multiple ways to type it so we just add a type there and um, yeah, we also need uh, the unit so I call that triv or this kind of empty tuple Okay, so if we define a programming language, we always have to say what are the values in the language. So here um, yeah, we have two values. So unit is a value and the lambda abstractions are also values. So, and yeah, I'm not um, defining uh, things like substitution and free variables, so I um, assume you're familiar with that. Um, so what we want to do now is define uh, cost semantics for the simple language. And what I will do is I will show three or four um, options how you can do it, and then we compare it and see what the pros and cons are. So, first option, so, you know, let's say cost semantics one. So is structural dynamics So this is um, what um, Bob uses in PFPL, yeah, sometimes also called um, small step uh, operational semantics. So there um, we define with rule induction the notion of kind of like yeah, one step of computation. So um, this um, yeah, E maps to E prime means E evaluates to E prime in one step. Okay, so and um, then our um, notion of complexity will simply be the number of steps it takes till we reach a value. So um, that's um, easy enough. So yeah, I'm gonna maybe write down the rules um, because we have enough time for that. So for the application, I mean, Bob talked already about it. Um, yeah, you have multiple options here. Um, how you want to evaluate it, you can do you know call by name, call by value. Um, today we are always going to do call by value because. Um, 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 it's easier to, to give a cost semantics for that and um, more importantly it's easier to analyze it later on with a type system. So yeah, what we do first um, is we evaluate um, E1 so if we can step 
time, then the application steps from um, E1 apply to E2 to E1 prime apply to E2. So then what kind of course happen is that the um, E1 is already a value, Well, in this case we step inside the E2, so then it looks like this. Okay, and um, so then there's one more case. Um, well, both can be a value, E1 and E2, and then we substitute. So, of course, um, this only works, I mean, we can only substitute if um, the E1 is indeed a function, but um, if we have a type safe language, so we assume um, here that this is the case, so then um, the type system will ensure that um, this is always the case. So E2 is a value. So we substitute 2 for x in E. Okay, so um, and then we can define our, our cost and we can say, okay, let E be a, a closed well type term. So I didn't define the type system here. Um, assume you've, you've seen that in, in Bob, Bob's lectures or also Frank's, um, how to do that. So, and um, then uh, the um, evaluation cost of E is N if E steps to a value in N steps or infinite otherwise. So of course there are some things um, we have to take care of. So we have to, you know, um, be sure that this is well defined at all. So there could be, you know, um, multiple such ends, but this is not the case here. So you could um, prove that, you know, if you had yeah, two um, different evaluations um, to, you know, value v prime with some number of steps n prime, then n is already uh, n prime is already equal to n, and v prime is already equal to v. So this kind of like yeah, determinism is something you need in your language in order to define it like that, right? So, um, but um, otherwise, um, it looks pretty good. So um, one thing that's nice about it is um, that yeah, we um, have a very natural way of dealing with divergent computations, right? They just step forever. Um, you'll see that's not the case with um, every cost semantics, but there are also some um, downsides with this notion. So any criticisms um, of it? Yeah. Well, we'll see about that. So there are some concerns of how, how we're going to like uh, deal with that in a type system, but that's um, something for next lecture. So yeah, you'll see it, it will be possible So um, to, to do that, yeah. We're also assuming that all the steps cost the same, which you know, seems typical, but not totally satisfactory. Exactly. So maybe, you know, we so the concern was like that all the steps um, have the same cost, namely one, and uh, maybe we want to assign different costs. For instance, when here you have this um, substitution going on, which you know can be, if you were to implement it, could be very costly, right? You would have to go through this whole um, expression E, find all the occurrences of X, and then plug the E2 in there, so it seems kind of like unfair to have like you know the the same cost for all these steps, um, 
or if you were to model something like you know memory usage or stack usage, so that's um, um, also not covered here. It's uh, mainly um, time that you get kind of like a coarse notion of of time, um, but still it's somewhat you know. Um, um, it's in, in the right ballpark, asymptotically at least, um, uh, what you want to have. So, okay, good. So, um, let's look at the, the next version. So, um, here we're going to use something. Do I have another one? something that's called um, big step semantics or evaluation dynamics. So, um, yeah, as I said, big step sometimes, which is not um, the best term. So in a big step semantics, you um, would kind of like specify something like this. Um, so you would say an expression E evaluates to a value V right away, and there's no notion of steps. So if you, you know, just have this, so um, uh, which means expression E evaluates to V. So then, um, kind of like you have no um, um, yeah, notion, you cannot look at this judgment and um, you, you can say, okay, how many steps, what is the complexity? So what we do then usually is we add um, another component to it, Q, which is usually a, a number that can be um, sometimes even negative if resources become available um, during the evaluation. So that's also possible for like, let's say memory, there's some deallocation, right? Um, so that kind of like measures um, um, the, the resource usage, uh, the cost um, of it. So what we also want to often do is um, add kind of like a cost metric to it that gives you, for instance, a constant cost for each operation you have in the language. So um, another thing that I want to do for reasons that yeah, will become more clear later, I want to add a evaluation environment, so that's a mapping from variables to values. Um, I add that to the judgment, so um, then I add this metric here, um, then we have our expression E, we have our cost Q, and our value V, so and the, the meaning is um, under environment V, yeah, which maps variables to values um, and metric M, yeah, which assigns, um, yeah, I'll, I'll say more about that in a second, kind of like uh, some constants to yeah, some um, 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 yeah, operations um, that we perform, some atomic operations. Um, so under environment V, metric M, um, expression E evaluates to value V with cost Q, which we just say is a rational number here, as I said, it could be negative if things become uh, available. So, um, yeah, for the metric, um, we also have uh, different options. <laughs> 
So what I want to do um, is just, again, something very simple. So for each um, syntactic form we have in the language, we have like one constant and, you know, we say, okay, what is the cost of evaluating this um, form? So um, just takes what um, labels, you know, a set of labels. So we have unit, um, we have application, we have the lambda, and uh, what else do we have? Uh, variables, right? So, um, and yeah, it um, gives a constant cost for each of them. And you could have it, you know, more um, complicated. So if you would, you know, um, um, I mean, you, you, it could depend. Um, um, the, the metric could also depend on other things that are known statically, for instance, the type of the function that you apply. You know, maybe some arguments cost more than others. You could have all these things, but uh, we take uh, a very simple approach here. Um, and so then um, we define the rules, and then um, we can have a break afterwards, maybe one theorem, and then we have a, a, a break. So, uh, the rule for the variable, um, well, in this case, the cost is just given by the metric, and what we have to do is we um, look up the variable in the environment, V. So that's an axiom, and um, so um, another one that I can squeeze in here is the one for unit. Again, can evaluate this to a value uh, right away, and the cost is given by M unit, yeah. For the for the other one here, for the structural dynamics, um, what is the cost of evaluating unit? Zero. Zero, exactly, because it's a value, which is already somewhat questionable, um, because you you will always get that right. Um, also, if you have, let's say, you know, a list that is a value, um, also like the cost will be zero. So um, this is already better here, um, where you can at least assign some cost um, to it. So yeah, that's also an axiom. So there's another Boring rule, um, the one for the lambdas. Yeah, nothing happens again, so the only rule where something interesting happens is actually the application. Okay, so the first thing we want to do in the application rule, I mean, it's our choice, but I say we first um, evaluate the E1. Yeah, so we take the environment V and evaluate the um, E1 the cost, let's say, C1, and what we get from it, because we're type safe, is function, the lambda abstraction. So then the next thing we have to do is evaluate in the same environment, also the two, or here I forgot the metric, yeah, always under the same metric. 
So then we evaluate the E2, have some cost C2, and you know, get some value V2. So now what do we want to do? We want to add a new binding to our environment because our argument X um, here in the function is now supposed to be this value V2, right? So in the structural dynamics, we substitute it here. Um, we use the evaluation environment. So I'll just write it like that. So we add a, a new binding to it, then evaluate the function body and have some cost C to it, get some value V. And this is definitely what we want to return down here. Okay. But we also have to say what the cost is. And there we just add everything up. Um, so we have C plus C1 plus 2 plus the cost of the application um, as given by our metric. Yeah, V2, um, yeah, sorry, this is not good here. This is too close together. So this belongs also to it, yeah. So that's the last thing we have to do. We have to then kind of like run the function body with the concrete argument, which is the V2. Okay, so one thing before the break. Um, so now um, the question is, of course, okay, what metric do we use? What are the numbers? So what is our, our cost, really? Um, and uh, there are different possibilities um, and um, different ways to justify your choice. So one thing we can say, um, of course, is like, OK, so if we really like the uh, structural dynamics. And we say, this is our ground truth. So um, if we want to have the same cost model as given by the structural dynamics, um, so what metric should we use? The metric with um, So, and you tell me what I should write here. Right here. So, so what I want is, um, for all closed, well-typed expressions, um, E evaluates to value in n steps if there's an empty environment under the metric S, E evaluates in n steps to the same value. So this is what I want. How should I define S? Yeah. Yeah, the values need to be zero. That's already good. What else? Yeah. Application is one. Variable? Zero. Zero, right. Good. And then we have this theorem. So that's one example. So you can you know, pick your cost semantics like that, and you justify it with some kind of like lower level model. And this is something that you know, Bob was talking about too. Um, you can do that um, in a similar way also for like a parallel language, which is then becomes like a bit more interesting, where you also have some underlying machine model. And you say, OK, you assign to it some you know, work cost and some 
you know, sometimes called like a span cost, um, which is the parallel cost, um, or sometimes also called depths. Um, and um, you then get like you know two numbers from your cost semantics and the theorem that says like okay if it has like you know work W and depth D then it you know can run on this low level machine with you know concrete number P processors in time. <laughs> so that's kind of like a fancier version of the same idea. Yeah. Right, so you can allow negative numbers if you want to model something like memory, like resources that become available. So if you want to do that, let's say you want to model the stack, then you actually want to have two things for the application, right, where, so you want to have like one cost that happens right before the application, and then another cost that happens right after the um, application, but you, you can do that, then you just have like app one and app two in there, and um, um, so you can do all these things. Yeah. This is just a very bare bone version of it. Yeah. Oh yeah, why would you want fractions? So um, that can arise, um, well, I think here it doesn't really matter. So here it's just because we can. I mean, you can always kind of like normalize it to, to um, um, some unit. Um, it becomes uh, more interesting uh, when you do the cost analysis because there it arises very naturally. Let's say, you know, you have a, um, a function um, that you know does some iteration over a list, and um, you know, in every iteration has cost one. Okay, good. So the the cost is then n, where n is the length of the list. Fine. But now imagine that the function matches on two list elements in every iteration. So then the cost is 0.5n. So the natural numbers kind of like show up in these bounds and this is kind of like why I always say like, okay, we can start with these rationals right away. Um, yeah. So I was thinking, since you have a big step, semantics, assume you are in a situation where in the end you output minus one, right? And we're talking about memory. But during the execution, you don't see a lot of memory. So would it be better to have sort of function rather than? Right. Very good point. So what happens for something like stack? You search right where then you would have like zero in the end because you deallocated everything, um, kind of like not useful. We'll talk about that after the break. OK, uh, five minutes break. But let's uh, continue. So, yeah, as um, somebody pointed out, so when resources become available, we are usually interested in the high watermark, right? So, um, like for memory, for instance, so let's say when resources become available, We want to know the high water mark, which is kind of like the um, maximum of resources that have been in use at some point during the evaluation. Right? A typical example is the, you know, um, stack space usage so typically you start with an empty stack so this is number of stack cells this is the time right and then look something like this at the end you know you, you you start with zero at the end you're down to zero and you have some recursive function so you keep allocating allocating and then um, you free everything at the end and so yeah what you really want to know is um, this 
high water mark here. So, but yeah, what um, the evaluation dynamics really gave us our cost dynamics with this uh, cost Q here. Um, so Q was more like the net cost, which in this case would be zero. Yeah, so this is um, uh, not very useful. So, yeah, what can we do um, with our evaluation dynamics? Exactly, we, that's one thing we could do. Um, I want to do that second. <laughs> There's another possibility um, where we could, some, we could have some notion of uh, resource safety. So we could just say, you know, we start with um, some um, um, amount of resources and if we run out, then we're stuck. Um, and if not, you know, then we have some leftover. So, and this is what we um, try to do first. So I call that resource safety. So uh, we have two options. So we can define um, something that looks like this. Q and Q prime, we also have the metric. Sometimes I forget to, to write it, so we always have this M here too. And we evaluate to a value. And so the meaning is um, under environment V, um, on the metric M and Q resources available E evaluates to V does not run out of resources and Q prime resources are available afterwards. So, yeah, this is something we, we can do and it's, it's not difficult, so We have such a tiny language, we can write down the rules. So, yeah, for the um, variable case, so the computational part is exactly the same as for the other rule. Yeah, we'll just look up the value for, for the variable. And, um, well, at least we should have um, enough resources available here in the input to pay for the cost of the variable lookup, which is given by our metric M that I, as I promised, forgot to write here. So, yeah, that's it. And the uh, um, yeah, the unit I don't even write. I maybe write the one more for the for the um, lambda abstraction, which looks exactly the same, right? So here, we just look up the cost for the uh, we take the cost of the lambda um, as given by the metric, and then computation doesn't do much; just returns the value so as before. Um, the rule that's interesting, of course, is the application rule as usual. So um, 
And there. What do we do? So we have E1, E2, all the way to V in the end. So, yeah, so we start with some resources, and so now the question arises um, when do we pay for the application? And let's say, you know, we pay right away. So, We have to have at least um, enough resources to pay for the application. So, and then, um, so we did that first, so we covered that already, um, which is maybe um, not very logical because the cost of the application might come later, but anyway, we covered it at the beginning. Um, so then um, we still have to evaluate the E1. So now this M app cost is gone, so we only have Q left, right? So um, we have to use this Q, remaining Q, to evaluate the E1. And let's say we get um, P as a result here. So E1 um, evaluates, hopefully, to a lambda like this. So now, um, yeah, we are probably down from Q to P, but maybe something became available, which is, would be even better for us. But at least we have P now. So that's what's true. And um, yeah, now we have to evaluate the E2. Uh, again, we will get some value V2. Um, and then we have some um, remaining um, um, resources are, let's say, and now we have to evaluate the function body, and um, we have R left, so... Oh, here we have to, of course, update our environment with the binding of X, as before, to V2, right, like this. So now um, we are down to R, um, and then maybe Q prime are left afterwards. We evaluate E to V, and we say Q prime is what we have left in the end. Yeah, we just thread the, the, this resource counter through. Yeah, it's really like a, a counter that you know goes up and down. Um, 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 and we have to have kind of like, you know, enough at the beginning. Otherwise, um, if we run negative, um, oh yeah, this is something um, I didn't say. I mean, the, the, um, this resource safety notion only makes sense if these cues that we write everywhere are non-negative, yeah? So, otherwise you, you don't get anything. If you, you know, can, can run negative in the middle, um, then uh, this is not what, what we want. So, um, here, um, where um, was it? Yeah, so, uh, that's important. So they have to be non-negative. Good, so then we can also like um, prove some uh, some theorems, um, maybe a lemma first. Um, squeeze it in here. So, yeah, so you tell me what the lemma is. Um, let's say, you know, I evaluate under the same metric an expression E start with Q, end up with Q prime resources, get a value V, and um, I do another um, evaluation where I start with a potentially different amount of resources, let's say P, let's say metric M, get a value V prime. So then, 
how do P, Q, P prime, Q prime, V, V prime <laughs> relate? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. So uh, exactly, Q minus Q prime is P minus P prime. So you, in both cases, have exactly the same net cost. Yeah. And what about the Vs? They're the same. They're the same, of course. Yeah, that's um, what, what we need. Expect and all these kind of like lemmas and you know theorems I show you. This is kind of like what you also would get if you had more stuff in the language, right? So this is uh, carry, carries over. Um, so good. So um, we still have to do the relation, of course, to um, the other um, cost semantics where we only accounted for the net cost and um, so um, what does the theorem say? So if, um, if uh, um, you have an expression E that evaluates to V um, with a starting counter Q and counter Q prime um, then How does it relate to the other semantics? Of course, we get the same value v, but um, what is the cost that I put here? Just q minus q prime. So, right. So um, you might wonder kind of like if there's also like some relation in the other direction. So if you know the net cost, um, um, do you know um, kind of like what Q and Q prime to put here? Not really. I mean, you know um, kind of like what the, what the difference between them should be, um, but you cannot really tell the high water mark from, from that. Um, so I mean, they're like in the yeah, other direction, kind of like if you would had like a C here and the Q and Q prime here um, in the evaluation, you would know that the difference is C, but yeah, um, not more than that. So um, yeah, in particular, um, what's not the case, yeah, so what you might think not, um, is something like this. So you might have some cost C here. And then you might think you have something like, oh, well, um, I have something like this. Starting with C, I end up with 0 um, in the um, resource safety one. So this is not the case. Um, yeah. This is only the case if you would have something like time where things never become available. So then this would be the case, but not in general. Okay, good. So um, last thing for today, um, and I'm in time, is um, the um, version that was suggested before, where we do something that's not plus when we um, account for the cost. So, um, and for that, so that's the second option we have, and I call that using a resource monoid. And the operation in the monoid um, is exactly the thing we use to replace the plus. Um, but what we have to do is we have to I mean, OK, you can always encode everything in one number, but morally, we have to keep track of two numbers um, you know, if we want it to be compositional. So there are multi many multiple things you could do, but what I like best is so we keep track of the high water mark 
and the resources that are left afterwards. And you need both because if you compose something, right, yeah, think of the memory again, it's very important how much is left afterwards. If you would just know the high watermark of the E1 and you would want to compose it with E2 and you would know the high watermark of the E2, um, you, you, you don't know what the high watermark of the a whole computation is because you really need to know what's left after E1, right? If the E1 is down to zero again and free gave, gave all the resources up, okay, then you could take the maximum. But in general, that's not true. If the E1 holds on to everything at the end, right, then you have to add it up. So um, you need to have some kind of like clever um, operation to combine it. So um, the notation we use for this one is on this, so we have the Q and Q prime again, but now, um, no, let me just write it in blue, um, the, the first Q here is the high water mark, and the Q prime here is the, you know, uh, leftover resources. Okay, so um, I'll just give you two rules. Um, I thought I had another one here. Great. So, um, yeah, maybe let's do the variable so then I don't have to write so much. Um, of course, always on a given metric again. Um, so for the variable now we have, um, yeah, or maybe you tell me what to write. So computationally it's clear, we just look it up, but yeah, what should we put here? What is the high watermark? I mean, it, has to involve the cost of the variable lookup, m of r. Is it q plus m of r? Well, we don't have a, a, a q really. M yeah. Of r. M of r. Yeah, but where do we put it? It's a high water mark. It's. Or the leftover. It's a high water mark, probably. Yeah, so that sounds good. So we put it here, but, and then, you know, Nothing is left anymore uh, afterwards, right? Um, we kind of like yeah, uh, consumed it. Um, there's a, another, well, so again, I didn't mention, should have mentioned here, it's also important that the Q and Q prime um, should be non negative. So, and here um, you have the a problem that the m var could of course be negative. So this rule is good if you know you have a, a, a cost actually. So um, if m var is not negative, so this is fine. Um, but what about um, if something becomes available? So then we don't have cost at all. So the high water mark is zero. And um, afterwards, the m var is available. So that's the other version. So if you know, something becomes available, so then we have zero, and then the m var. Okay, so, and the fun part is, yeah, what do we do for the um, application? And this will basically be your homework, but uh, we write a few things down, so. Okay, so what we do, um, is again, we evaluate the E1, have some cost Q, Q prime, 
then, um, oh, forgot the result of the whole thing, which is a lambda. Have some cos q, q prime. Then we evaluate the E2 to some value V2. Have some cos P, P prime. And then we have to evaluate the function body like before. Get some value V, some cost R, R prime. Yeah, so again, we have our three costs. And before, we added everything up together. And here, let's only do the case where the um, cost of the application is non-negative. So then what? So then first, um, we have the cost of the application. Zero. Then we have the cost of the E1, Q, Q prime. Then we have the cost the E2, P, P prime. And then we have the cost of the evaluation of the function body, R, R prime. So, yeah. And we have this undefined monadic operation, um, this multiplication, as I wrote it. Yeah, question? Oh, good point. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Here we have to then, um, um, uh, yeah, take the. Um, 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 kind of like multiply with minus one um, to get a positive thing there. Yeah. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Never mind. Never mind. I see. Yeah. Okay, so the homework for you is now to define this operation. Define this operation P P prime times um, Q Q prime. So the um, you know multiplication of our monoid. Um, and yeah, well, of course, so that's an easy homework. You can just give a, a random definition. But of course, um, we want the theorem to hold again. So, and what is the theorem that needs to hold? Um, so it's as follows. So if um, we have an evaluation with our new monoid semantics, where we get Q, Q prime. So Q is the high water mark, Q prime is the leftover, then it's safe to run the code. Um, resource safety semantics, so Q, Q prime E evaluates to V. And um, the other direction, so if um, you have a safe run, um, Q, Q prime, that gives you value V, um, then um, you have a run in the resource safety one where you also evaluate to the same value, have cost P, P prime, and P is smaller or equal to Q. So in other words, the kind of like difference will always be the same um, um, in both cases, um, again. Um, but um, the one with the resource monoid gives you kind of like the minimal um, um, amount you can start with without running out of resources. So this is what the theorem says. And now you have to think, right, so how do you 
um, combine these two, so you, you're in a situation where you have two computations, right? The first one hits the watermark P and ends up at P prime. The second one hits the watermark Q, ends up at Q prime. And what do you put here for the whole computation? So that's the um, homework. Okay, questions, urgent questions? Yeah. Yeah, in this, in this case, it doesn't make much sense, right? But, you know, think of like, um, in case of the application, right, you would have two um, app one and app two and you were to model um, stack cost, right? So this is just like an abstract example where, um, 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 well, because we can allow it, but like, I don't, I'm not sure if there would be any realistic cost measure that would have something negative for the variable. Yeah. And there's another way to set this up um, where you could say the cost is specified by the user yeah, and you have a specific tick expression where you put in a tick. So there kind of like, yeah, you could put in something negative. Um, um, but the rule would look exactly like the, the var rule um, when it comes to the cost. So I just use it as an example. Okay, good. So then that's it for today. And then we look next time, um, which is tomorrow morning, um, at the type system to reason about cost. Thanks.